Mike O'Connor, um, headlining today's uh, talks. Over to you, Rick. Thanks very much. All right, thanks. Uh, well, first off, uh, good to see so many people uh, from past RISC V workshops and foundation days. It's been a while, actually, I think, since we've all been together in events like this, or at least it has been for me. So it's, it's really great to see you all. Uh, thanks to the Fozzie Foundation guys for organizing this. It's pretty awesome. And, uh, and thanks uh, to, um, to this fine gentleman here, to Jonathan and the team at uh, UCSB for hosting us. Uh, it's a, uh, this building's pretty cool, actually. So uh, it's good to be here. Uh, so my name is Rick O'Connor. I run an organization called the Open Hardware Group. Who's heard of the Open Hardware Group? Where have the rest of you been? Come on. <laughs> um, before uh, running the Open Hardware Group, I uh, had the great fortune of hanging around with Dave and Kirsta and, and Andrew and, and Yunsup and the guys and started the RISC V Foundation. Uh, I guess started the conversation in 2013. Whoops. I'm going to sleep apparently. Started the conversation to do that around 2013, early 2014. We incorporated the RISC V Foundation nonprofit. Uh, 501c6, registered in Delaware, in case you want to go see the building. It's fascinating. Um, in August of 2015, and then I ran that organization for a long time, uh, until around 2019, thereabouts. And number one question I used to get when running that organization was, hey, RISC V guy, uh, I love this thing. I love, I love this open ISA. This is great. Uh, but I'm not, you know, I'm not a processor architect. I really want an open source core. That's what I really want. And Chisel is fantastic, but my company uses System Verilog. And when I told them about Chisel, they told me, if you want to get fired, change the CAD tool flow that is a known first pass success, tape out on a, you know, a deep submicron, several millions of dollar tape out, try to change that inside you know, the EDA group of, of a large semiconductor company and you'll get a lot of static. Wow, this is uh, happy sleeping. So, so with all of that, there was a bunch of companies that wanted to uh, adopt RISC-V based cores that were written in System Verilog and used commercial EDA tool flow. And this is not to say that any of the work around Chisel or anything else is bad. It's not, it's not at all. It's, it's very much an and, not an or. Right? There's very good work happening in, in, um, you know, in those projects, and that work should continue, obviously. Um, but this is about pragmatically adop adopting open source hardware. So that my talk today is about the commercial lessons that we've learned since starting the Open Hardware Group and launching a bunch of projects, which I'll talk about, and how large-scale semiconductor companies that are now shipping you know, uh, close to 100 million open source cores. It's not talked about very much yet. These are, uh, you know, captive cores. The API is not exposed to the user yet, but this stuff's coming, and it's pretty cool. So, with that, give you a little bit of an overview of what this open hardware ecosystem looks like today, and I think it's worthwhile casting our minds back 20, 25 years ago, the beginning of open source software. Those of you that have the really, really good-looking silver streaks in their hair. Well, uh, well, well, we'll have lived through some of this. Those of you that haven't, it just might be fun to go pull out some of the old articles and the rhetoric that surrounded the industry back then. And then use that as, a, as the backdrop for how can we learn and understand from that history from 20 to 25 years ago and implement things that actually might help us collectively uh, chip away at this open hardware, open source hardware conundrum. One of the things that I sort of take on the chin uh, all the time when we're talking about the open hardware ecosystem is there are some folks in the community, in the open source community, that believe that if, if everything is an open source, then nothing is. And that, you know, that's an idealistic view of the world, but it's not a practical one. And you won't get adoption, commercial adoption, which is required, and you'll see, oh my goodness, this guy should deliver power in here. Um, no, I mean, I got 100% power, just happy to go to sleep. You know what it wants me to do? Probably go faster with my slides. 
Uh, so why don't, we, why don't we just jump in? So the Open Harbor Ecosystem is, is a nonprofit uh, registered in Canada and in Brussels. Uh, I'm, I'm Canadian, so forgive the accent from time to time. Um, where, where collaborators, both from industry and academia and individuals, collaborate on a family of RISC-V open source cores called Core 5, really clever name, um, that are written in system Verilog. And m probably the most important aspect is that they're developed, if you, if you worked at Silicon Labs or NXP or you know, any large scale SOC company, they're developed to fit into that CAD tool flow. We're not trying to tell anybody how, what tools they should use. And when those guys, those big guys adopt different tools, then the projects will you know, migrate towards them, uh, to, towards those tools. So we're very much interested, you know, there's a lot of talk about the verification challenge, and I know it's a big one, and you, the use of UVM and System Verilog and so on. It's really, really a tough nut to crack. And to get the verification teams and those SOC companies to change, this is annoying as hell. I will plug in my adapter. Uh, to get the verification teams and those big companies to change their behavior, highly unlikely. So let's not, let's not in, in least, at least in this ecosystem, let's not try. Let's just give them what they say they need, whether they're right or wrong. Let's just give them what they say they need and have those wins inside these companies. So we have, we have companies uh, you know, throughout the world, North America, Europe, and Asia, uh, focused on, on these best-in-class, if you will, current best-in-class industry practices for how to release a large-scale SOC in deep submicron uh, technology nodes. And now that I kill, okay, there we go. So we've got over 100 um, members and partners at the table, lots of logos that you'd recognize. Uh, on the corporate side, um, lots of logos that you'd recognize on the academic side, lots of logos that you'd recognize on the partner side. And we'll talk about how some of these guys or most of these guys play in, in the ecosystem as we go through the lessons learned. The, the way that the organization is structured, um, very similar to the way we structured the RISC-V Foundation, there's a marketing working group and a technical working group. The technical working group is basically the engineering resource, if you will, in the, in the organization. And there's four task groups. Cores task group works on the cores. Verification task group does system Verilog UVM based verification work. And software and, and hardware task groups are effectively internal customers, if you will, doing SOC, FPGA, board level development that use the cores um, and software task group. IDE, compiler work, uh, operating system porting, all that good stuff. There's probably 27 active projects underway right now. Across these 100 and some odd member uh, organizations, there's about five to 600 engineers around the world collaborating on those 27 or so projects. So it's pretty cool stuff. Um, and it's all of the projects are focused on eventually open source code, open source RTL for these cores that will be suitable and usable in a high volume production SOC. All right, so uh, this might be obvious to some of you, but free beer, free speech, the whole notion of free software, changing that to, no, no, you know, open source is a better word. So we don't, we don't get stuck, if you will, on the, the semantics or the, the stigma of free in the English language, right? So this, this was work that happened more than 20 years ago. The, that's where the term open source came from because it started out as the free, you know, free software foundation, right? And uh, free open source silicon. So um, that's where the open source initiative uh, started. And this, this team has kept some interesting stats. So if you look at the first decade, this is when this is when, you know, all the, oh my God, my hair's on fire. We're all gonna, you know, we're just gonna die. We're gonna run off a cliff together. If anybody ever dreams about putting, you know, an open source operating system in a server, oh my God, how could that possibly work? And there was all kind like that, um, you can have, we'll have the slide sent out later, I think, but that link to the register article 
in 2001 where Microsoft said Linux is a cancer is still live. You can go read that and it's kind of entertaining. I mean, it's just, it's, it's silly, right? And, and fundamentally, it's really because people just didn't understand how open source software and proprietary software were gonna coexist and what the business model would look like. And that's exactly where we are today with open source hardware. And you know what's interesting with the the uh, the ISA with the RISC-V ISA is it's really the the availability of a free and open ISA is has actually been the, the cornerstone for making it possible to actually really have open source hardware, and it, it's it's brought a lot of attention to that possibility. So you know at the beginning in the early late or sorry in the late 90s early 2000s it was really about this was entirely controversial. The industry was kind of um, uh, divided on whether this made any sense. Towards the end of that 10-year period, hey, you know, the CIOs at large scale uh, companies that had a huge infrastructure of compute uh, requirement, they started to understand that there was a, a benefit to open source implementation. So it started to change. And then in the next 20 years, so how long did it take? 2001? Linux is a cancer, 2015, Microsoft loves Linux. 14 years, you know, pretty, kind of a long time. And then, you know, now with uh, uh, the uh, Windows subsystem for Linux, uh, you know, environment, it's, it's just, it's a no brainer. I mean, it's, you know, it's, it's, a, it's not a discussion item. I can guarantee you that every one of the hardware companies that's part of the open hardware ecosystem today, the project teams that are engaged in the ecosystem, obviously they, they think this is a good idea. There's a equally strong and maybe even stronger and certainly larger contingent in their own company that thinks this is hogwash. Why the hell are we wasting any time with these open source cores? That's, that existed throughout this evolution. Hopefully we're not, as a hardware industry, going to take 20 years. Hopefully we can understand the learnings from our software cousins, if you will, and get there faster. All right. So that's, that's the end of uh, the you know, open hardware overview and a uh, uh, little brief history uh, on the open source software. The point that I've, the reason I put up those uh, history slides for open source software is, is really to set the context for you know, not everybody thinks this is a good idea, and uh, it's not actually a technical problem that we need to solve, right? Uh, critical mass and commercial adoption and confidence and trust and risk. My, my goodness, the amount of conversations I have with the legal departments of some of these companies is staggering. Um, so there's a lot entangled in how we make this safe for folks to adopt open source uh, IP. And that can be open source IP in the f sense of a core, or an open source language like Chisel, or, and, 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 not or, and everything in between. So I'm gonna talk about three fundamental, uh, to get past uh, both the legal review department, the IP department, if you will, of these major corporations, um, and the, um, uh, you know, the C-suite of executives. These are three sort of body scar learnings, if you will, that we've gone through over the uh, last few years. Permissive use. So something that's really clear is GPL-based licensing is, you know, going by way of the dodo bird. This is a report uh, from uh, the White Source Software uh, Group, and you can see that uh, you know, the, the lion's share of the license usage as of the end of 2021 is, uh, is permissive. And I've got another slide here that uh, shows you what that trajectory has been like. The blue, bar, blue, blue portion of the bar is um, permissive, permissive based, whereas the, uh, the orange bar or yellow bar is GPL and uh, copyleft based. So, um, what are we at there? Greater than 77% in 2021, um, all uh, permissive based. Okay, so that doesn't sound too outrageous. Although the folks that really like GPL based licenses, 
believe that the to be a to be a purist, if you will, an open an open open source purist. Of course, it should be GPL based because everybody should be forced to grant back based on the license. That's not going to work when large system and semiconductor hardware based companies who sit on mountains, a treasure chest full of patents uh, for their technology, they're, they're just absolutely not going to expose that. So the contribution, the grant back contribution has to be voluntary. And it has to occur because it makes sense for them to do so commercially. There's a business benefit for them to do that, right? So the license part absolutely needs to be permissive. And they need to see that commercial benef benefit in order to give back to the community. And that's not that hard to do if you set the ecosystem up uh, properly. And Apache is a perfect license, has patents included in the, in the license, if you're not familiar with the Apache license. It's a software license, and the good part is, all the legal departments that you talk to at the hardware company, oh yeah, we don't really care about the software, that's open source, that's okay, so Apache's okay, and that's a, you, know, you get a real easy win when you have an Ap Apache conversation with the legal team at a semiconductor company. Because they go, oh yeah, yeah, we've signed off on Apache before. So that's good, because they have software projects, inevitably, that they use. But is Apache enough? Well, obviously, the answer to that's no. That's and and uh, more good work by the, the great guys at the Fozzie Foundation around a license called SolderPad. Uh, so Andy Katz um, gave me these slides. He's from Moorcroft's um, a, a sort of boutique law firm in the UK. Uh, that, uh, and Andy is probably recognized as one of the leaders in the open source licensing space. And what, what SolderPad does is it takes, it started out by kind of munching up Apache and rewriting it, even though it was really going to use the base of Apache, um, and, and created a new license that was based on Apache. But that made it harder for the legal teams who are already familiar with Apache to review it. So what they did with SolderPad 2 and 2.0 2, 2 and 2.1 is it's literally just one page of new definitions that augment the definitions that are in Apache. So it's an adder on top of Apache. So you get to then go into the legal department and say, hey, this is Apache, plus these like 15 sentences. So that's all you have to review. And it helps to bring more definitions and const constructs to cover physical hardware for silicon and databases associated with, with doing those designs. So it's, it's, it's very useful from that standpoint. There's more, I got more uh, details in terms of how it was extended around authorship and rights. I'm not gonna go through that because I have many more slides than this. Uh, as well as uh, how it deals with uh, um, source and, and object form and source code and you know, bit streams for FPGAs and all kinds of stuff. So it, um, fundamentally, this then gives us a license that uh, the legal teams at these companies are happy with, patents are not exposed, and you get a thumbs up into the business, you know, the business unit, if you will, or the business team, the executives that think it's a good idea to pursue open source. The legal guys are now happy about it, or no, they're not unhappy about it. <laughs> That's probably better. This is the big, this is the real big one, right? So IP quality, you're gonna walk into your best boss's office and throw your, your, your employee badge down on the desk and say, yeah, boss, just downloaded this cool core, uh, core from a university GitHub repo. And we're gonna throw it in our, uh, yeah, we're gonna throw it in our next generation tape out. It's great, let's go. <laughs> yeah. Uh, so what we what we focused on starting the open hardware ecosystem was this is a ver verification problem. This is fundamentally a verification challenge, and we got to conv convince the verification uh, experts in, in these commercial adopter companies that what, what we're doing or that it's possible to assemble a verification framework that is contributed to by engineers from around the world to make a verification infrastructure that looks like and feels like the same verification infrastructure that these guys would have done in their own company. 
So we have a verification task group. And so first and foremost, let's go back to the rule I said earlier, if we need and use the same tools they're using. And probably, I don't, don't have a source for it other than just anecdotally knowing far greater than 90% of high volume SOCs that are in production today have been developed likely using System Verilog and verified with a UVM based methodology. All of the big three EDA guys have an infrastructure that supports that. All of the test benches that you'll see for process, processor verification use those tools. Um, and in particular, uh, and I'll talk about uh, step and compare methodologies and so on, in particular have some, some means of generating instructions randomly. They don't know what, the, doesn't matter what the code is as long as it's, a, you know, um, it's correct in terms of what the ISA allows and then stepping through that, that verification uh, flow using system Verilog and UVM based test benches. So we've developed uh, a verification infrastructure called Core 5 Verif. It runs on all of the big three system Verilog simulators from Cadence, Siemens, and, and Synopsys. It uses the Google DV random instruction generator and at the retire of every single instruction compares the DUT with a golden reference model. Um, it's not like a post simulation trace compare where you've got to go through the, you know, the trace files and, and find things and then start over again. Um, and this is, this is what you'd see inside any processor company um, you know, that's been, been developing their own course for some time, something similar to this. And a whole bunch of UVM agents running around to control the thing. All of this stimulus and these agents, everything except for the system Verilog simulator, some of the commercial reference models, like the one from the in Paris, all of this stuff is open source in our GitHub repos, called, and it's called uh, Core 5 Verif. Whoops, did I go back past one? No. So we've used this a few times. Uh, we, have, we use uh, also to communicate quality, or at least where a core is. We use um, uh, NASA's uh, technology readiness level scale uh, to define uh, when a core is done, or when IP is ready, if you will. So RTL freeze uh, for us is TRL5. That means it's ready, this is IP that's ready to be used in a system um, or deployed in an SOC. And we publish the coverage uh, data. So all of the coverage reports, this is uh, using Cadence tools, uh, line coverage, conditional coverage, FSM coverage. Those reports are all available um, for, as each core goes through a TRL5 or an RTL freeze release. So where we're headed is even more and more uh, flexibility with UVM based uh, agents that control everything. Um, there's things that the Google and random instruction generator can't do. We're wrapping that up, wrapping a, um, a, a core called Core 5 DV wrapper around that. There's things that some of the reference models can't do, Core 5 RM reference model wrapper around that. And uh, transaction scoreboarding uh, for the, the step and compare uh, capability on the uh, core versus the dot. Uh, sorry, the, the uh, dot versus the model. So this, this is probably our biggest task group and our most act, active task group in terms of system Verilog uh, verification engineers contributing from around the world. I'm not going to go through all these details. We'll, uh, like I said, we'll have the slides and you can look at that or we can talk about it off, uh, offline afterwards. All right. So, okay, we need to have permissively licensed IP so that the legal team thinks it's safe. Um, we need to have a verification infrastructure that replicates or is similar to the type of verification that a processor company would do on their own so they feel comfortable contributing to this, taking it, standing it up in their own compute environment, and, and that it's, you know, it's the way they're verifying their own processors. Okay, uh, for real critical mass and adoption, there needs to be an ecosystem. It can't just be one core. Uh, the, there needs to be a roadmap and sort of lots of cores, if you will. There needs to be all the software support that you'd expect, IDEs and embedded operating systems and Linux-based uh, development. There needs to be real meaningful SOC implementations that you can go take a look at, maybe even take for a test drive. 
So a roadmap and an ecosystem underneath it. So the way that we started was two cores from uh, the Luca Benini's team. How am I doing? I'm, I'm probably going too slow, right? We'll blame that on this laptop yeah. going to sleep. Um, we started with really two cores out of ETH Zurich, uh, Luca Benini's team out of ETH Zurich. Um, and fundamentally, the, the way that the ecosystem got started was because these cores started to generate some interest uh, from the companies who thought RISC-V was a great idea, but wanted system Verilog cores. Um, you know, uh, the the you know, Chisel-based stuff that came out of UC Berkeley was cool, was interesting, but you know these companies knew they weren't going to get that past anybody. And if there was, if so, if there was inside their company, so if there was going to be adoption, and not because it's bad, it's not an or, it's an and, right? Um, not because it's bad or anything, it's just not how their company development flow works. Along comes Luca and his team with a bunch of system Verilog based cores uh, that, you know what, they were pretty good. You know, they're half decent, PPA metrics were good. They worked, these cores, before they ever got near the open hardware ecosystem, had seen dozens and dozens of tape outs. Some companies have them in production, had them in production well before the, anything started in the open hardware ecosystem. But fundamentally, the RISCI core, which is basically a Cortex M4, right, a four-stage embedded class core, and then the Iran core, uh, which is basically like an A53-ish. So we call the CVE4 family and CVA6, so embedded four-stage, the E4. And for those of you that need a secret decoder ring on the on the uh, on the naming, <laughs> and um, application class six-stage core, and then a whole bunch of these uh, that spun out of that. So we now have nine different cores that are under various stages of development. This is not meant to be an eye chart. You can go see this on the Open Hardware GitHub repo. It's on the, land, the top page of the repo and links down to all of the different projects for, for where these cores come from. There's uh, four or five uh, different cores in the application class stage. So these are li Linux capable cores. And on the embedded class, uh, the original RISCI core got spun into four different variants. And then we also are sort of taking back the zero risky core, the IBEX core, if you will, with uh, the last one at the bottom called the E20. Uh, so the, the low risk team has done a really good job with IBEX, which is what the zero risky core was. They've added a bunch of things to it, uh, which is great for their uh, secure boot uh, project that they're working on, Open Titan. Uh, but for the, the companies that are in this ecosystem, they want to shrink it back down again, and that's what the E20 project's about. So the point is, uh, of those, like I said earlier, 27 projects that are underway, a bunch of them are obviously the cores, all using the Core 5 verif verification infrastructure. So that's good. I talked a little bit about the software uh, requirements. We have, this is probably our second biggest task group uh, because you know there's GCC work, LLVM work, Visual Studio and Eclipse IDE based work underway, free RTOS work, HAL work, uh, SDK work for Core 5 MCU, which I'll talk about in a bit. Lots of, lots of great work going on in this task group uh, with software that's basically ready to run out of the box on all of these processors. On the hardware side, so this task group basically takes the cores and implements them, either into SOCs, FPGAs, development kits, and so on. So we use, we're partnered with Digilent, and we use the Nexus A7 and Genesis 2 uh, platform, depending on the project. And obviously you use our own you know, uh, Core 5 based IDE, which is Eclipse based to, to bring these things up. And this has been a fun project. Like all SOCs, the tape out just continues to be in the future, but <laughs> we, think, we think that future's finally arrived. And uh, we're, t we're taping out uh, shortly here on um, a device called Core 5 MCU. It's a very simple, bare bones MCU with very simple peripherals. That, but the point is, it's a, you know, a, a deep sub micron SOC. Uh, GF Global Foundries is a member. Um, we're building this in 22 FDX. It uses the, the core that is frozen, that TRL5 RTL freeze uh, core, the E40P. And uh, also has a bunch of some commercial IP in it, so the, 
the bl block in the middle there is QuickLogic's in embedded FPGA array, and that'll sit, sit alongside the core, and you'll be able to bang your own accelerator in, into this uh, and play with it uh, with open FPGA tools. And uh, that QR code works, so if you uh, go to that now, you can enter your name to be told when these kits will be available for order. We expect to be shipping them at the end of the year, um, and hopefully we'll actually have some kind of you know, project or fund at the RISC-5 Summit, assuming there's going to be one in December. It's not going to get moved. Um, and uh, this is pretty cool. So we've got uh, a bunch of uh, great, great companies supporting this and working on this. Uh, the, the team, the IoT team at Amazon has been very active uh, and interested in this core. It's going to be a little camera on the, on the board. You know, this is, um, and actually uh, the Wi-Fi radio is from Espresso, if you can see up there with the antenna. Uh, and that's got a RISC-V core in it, uh, so uh, that's kind of fun. This is not, you know, we're not solving world hunger or anything with this MCU. This is not meant to be the, the best MCU you've ever seen. And, and you know, you, you, you can get a cheaper MCU kit someplace as well. So don't, don't be shocked when you're, uh, if you do decide to order one and you're paying a couple hundred bucks. The point is, it's open source from the RTL right down to the PDK, but the PDK is not open source. But everything from there up. And then on the 64-bit side, lots of good stuff going on there with uh, the CBA6 family. Uh, so we've got Yocto running now, uh, uh, an Eclipse-based IDE. Talus has uh, been spearheading the, this whole project around the CBA6 with uh, quite a bit of activity. Uh, Amazon guys are supporting it with free RTOS ports. Uh, leveraging OpenPython and PMesh, we've got a dual core SMP uh, instance running with this 64-bit core on a Genesis 2 platform. Um, and a little while ago, come on, click. There we go. A little while ago, uh, Jonathan and his team banged 64. Uh, 16 of these 64-bit cores uh, into a Stratix 10 uh, Altera Intel board, all on uh, PMesh on OpenPython. And we also have a project uh, funding. I have a, you know, Canadians are generally nice people, and I have $22.5 million from the Canadian federal government to go spend on uh, research projects, as long as they get um, matched, co-funded. By, uh, by industry. And the first one that we did uh, has uh, uh, Polytechnic Montréal working with ETH Zurich to add a vector accelerator into the CBA6. And that's uh, going to get built into an SOC, again, at N22 FDX with Global uh, and the help of Jonathan's team here at UC Santa Barbara, a quad uh, vector accelerated CBA6 cluster uh, using the open Python PMesh uh, environment and then a, an off-chip bridge uh, to the, to the off-chip knock the same way that the, some of the open Python stuff has been done before. Uh, just some of the details on what that project looks like. Um, they expect to be able to get to a gigahertz clock speed. Again, not, you know, this is not blowing the doors off of, uh, of anything, but it's a pretty interesting uh, uh, platform and a fully open source, you know, uh, vector compliant 64-bit uh, RISC-V core. And that's sort of the end of the, the sort of the lessons part of, of my talk, uh, where, you know, we've had, we've had some pretty interesting, all of these projects are driven because there's a commercial uh, end user who wants, who wants to then ultimately adopt it. And, you know, I think that the, when you look at that trajectory from 2001, it's a cancer to, oh my gosh, we really love this stuff in 2015. And that's because Microsoft, it took that long, but Microsoft figured out that they could actually make a business out of supporting Linux uh, uh, in various fashions. And, I, and you know, I believe we'll get there in the hardware industry. Um, EDA tools, open PDKs, and deep submicron nodes, those challenges will take a long time, uh, but, uh, you know, you've got to start chipping away pragmatically at, at early, early wins. And that's the focus of this ecosystem. So 
thanks for your time. I'm happy to, happy to take any questions. Fantastic. Thanks, Rick. First question. Uh, hey, Rick. Uh, great presentation. Um, I had a kind of a more of a software, hardware strategy question. In the software world, uh, Red Hat and Canonical were one of, I would say, they were the key players who took the open source to commercialization. Uh, do we know what uh, we will see in the open hardware, or are there companies who will be like that? Hmm. Uh, that's a good question. Uh, I wish I had that crystal ball, uh, to be honest. Um, for, so for those of you that don't know, IBM bought Red Hat uh, three years ago now for $31 billion. All right, so if, when you think about that, oh my gosh, this is crazy. You know, Linux is a cancer back to 2001. Um, yeah, you know, maybe whether that was a good acquisition for IBM, by the way, or, or not, is a, that's a different conversation. But um, you know, fundamentally, an open source uh, operating system company had a valuation of thirty-one billion dollars, according to IBM. Um, so, you know, the, clearly, the Red Hat Enterprise release models uh, and support that were, were offered around uh, Linux certainly resonated with a number of large organizations. How that's going to translate into uh, hardware uh, isn't clear. Right now, the, the lion's share, so we're, the companies that are using the cores are not disclosing what they're using them in and where they are, but we're just under 100 million core, open hardware cores, core five cores in production now. Uh, they're totally captive cores, and these are companies who uh, cover, the, cover the spectrum of they could do it completely on their own themselves if they wanted to and, and have for many years. Uh, or, or they can license the IP from a commercial IP vendor uh, and, and they cover that spectrum and they have for many years. They're all ARM customers. And what the open source model is allowing these guys to do is change the commercial dynamics of the licensing side of it, but also not have to do everything themselves if, you know, if they were rolling their own core, custom core, supporting it with their own tool chain and just forever and a day having this you know, sort of custom flow. But it's allowing them some degree of customization. But the, I think the important part here is uh, these are companies who already have the chops, if you will, or the skill set to do this work. I think where the tipping point will come is when the IP is adopted by companies who could never do it on their own anyway. And they're, they're being drawn to the fact that this is now a new dynamic and a new business model that they can take advantage of without uh, having to have been skilled in the art to begin with in order to sort of de-risk their journey. I, I don't really know when that would come. Andrew Waterman, Sci-5. Uh, I was wondering if there are any plans to offer dev boards, perhaps in conjunction with one of your member companies. Yeah, yeah. Well, you, you have a, we have an example of a dev board. This dev kit, this dev kit's a real board. You didn't scan your QR code and get on the, get on the reservation list. Andrew, come on. I, th I thought you'd be first. Cool. Uh, Rick, if I may, um, going back to the, the question before, can you talk a little bit more about the commercials, perhaps, of, of how it works with the member companies or the you know oh, collaborators? Sure. And sure. Um, I should probably know this, but it, like, do you envisage, or maybe you already do, offer like consulting services and things like that, or is that part of the roadmap? Or yeah, so uh, we we don't within the open. So we have staff in the open hardware, you know, company. It's a company. It's a nonprofit co company, but it's a, obviously a a legally registered, federally registered Canadian nonprofit, and also in Brussels. Um, and the, the staff that's in the open hardware, you know, company portion, if you will, is here to help from an engineering standpoint, the member companies conceive of and, um, and implement the projects that they want to work on. And the way that the, way that the ecosystem works is 
anybody in this room could go and take anything off the GitHub repo and have at it, right? You don't need to be a member. It's permissively licensed stuff. Everything that's there is up for grabs. Where you go, you know, hallelujah, pass the hot sauce, right? This is just great. Let's go. Obviously, if nobody supports the creation of an ecosystem, then there is no ecosystem. And that the members, all those 103 some odd logos that we flipped through um, earlier, uh, they join, they, they pay membership dues and join and contribute engineers because they have particular projects that they want to run, right? So it's the members that decide what projects, those 27 some odd projects that I mentioned earlier, are driven by and led by the member companies. Um, you know, there's a voting process and a meritocracy process for how we elect committers to the repos and, you know, do all, all of the curating of the pull requests and the IP that comes into the, the, to the repos and so on. So there's an engineering release methodology flow uh, and, and so on. But the, the, the way that there's no, there's no fees for licensing anything, it's open source, obviously. There's, it's permissibly licensed. Anyone can use it and it's, uh, the projects are driven by the members. Did that answer your question? Yes, but I'm, I'm wondering more on the side of perhaps a hardware-oriented like, consultancy, because uh, like I know Ant Micro are out there doing great work, they big, are. big player in the kind of like open yep. source consultancy area. I don't know of many others though, right, that, that sort of are guns for hire to work on this open source stuff. Well, what, what we're starting to see is, so there, the hardware industry has many, many uh, medium-sized, say, 100, uh, 50 to 100, and maybe even smaller, maybe slightly bigger sized hardware companies that, you know, they know RTL, they know verification, they know how to do SOC work, uh, basically contract engineering work, right, where all of the big SOC guys have some amount of staff, uh, you know, bandwidth uh, and, and capacity management through a network of, you know, third-party contractors that they work with. And what we're starting to see is a lot of these companies are becoming conversant in these cores and, and this framework and being able to, hey, I can contract my services to you, Mr. Company, to help you implement, you know, your embedded four-stage core. And by the way, I've done this three times already and here's with, with X, Y, you know, other customers and here's where the IP is. You might... You might, you might consider switching to this core if, if you want. So we're starting to see uh, almost little mini Red Hat, you know, to, to the earlier question, and uh, starting to see little mini Red Hat, you know, service providers or, or maintainers that are just adopting the cores as part of their uh, contract engineering services business. Good, okay. I have a quick question. Um, Sure. Rick, the uh, Apache license gives you a very tiny part of the patent problem, right? It's very limited, to put it up here. Like, is there any plans around open hardware or even like a broader ecosystem maybe of doing patent pooling? Is there any contractual uh, setup that you already have in place between your member companies? Good question. Great question. So uh, same problem with the RISC-V Foundation when we started that. And one of the things, uh, patent pooling is really hard to do, uh, for one. Uh, but one of the, one of the sort of, uh, a proxy to patent pooling is get everybody in the sandbox. Let's get everybody in the room, just this room, to agree to play nice with each other. Let's, let's just have everybody in this room sign off on this tiny little paragraph that's a covenant not to sue. We're going to share stuff around, and we're going to agree not to sue each other uh, around using this stuff. So in the RISC-V uh, membership agreement, when I started that organization, we had, there's a covenant not to sue um, uh, paragraph in the agreement. There's a, also a covenant not to sue paragraph in these membership agreements. And okay, uh, so the obvious, you know, sort of elephant in the room is, well, okay, well, not everybody's going to be a RISC-V member and not everybody's going to be an open hardware member, and that's true. But there are many, many, many RISC-V Foundation members now, and not as many, but growing number of uh, open hardware members. It's not a guarantee, but it has a virtual, the effect of a virtual patent pool. Because it, when you get those deep uh, holders of uh, patent portfolios to sign off on not um, litigating against those patents for the designs that are you know, in this sandbox, that's, that's, a, that's a pretty effective deal, except 
when you bring up the argument that, oh yeah, well no IP vendor would ever sue their customers. Oh, <laughs> wait a minute. <laughs> Yeah, that's what I'm wondering. Like, I don't think it's 100% correct for Risk Five, uh, so it's good if you have it in open hardware. But here, what do you mean you don't think it's 100% correct for Risk Five? I don't think that's a current regulation that you have, right? So What's that? Currently, sure. it's only it's similar to Apache what we have at the moment. Like, you can't sue for patents for stuff that you contributed yourself in Risk Five. You can sue for stuff that you didn't contribute. Yeah, it's. It's the beginning, right? You and you can sue, like, what I mean, like, you can sue everyone outside, like, okay, you can say, yep. like, but in open hardware, uh, yeah, I'm wondering, like, there's open, in, uh, this open innovation network and other things that help you pooling nowadays, like. Yeah, and we've had lots of conversations with them, and, you know, that some of the work that, that's being done there, it might, we might do something down the road. There's nothing currently mm. in the works, right? The, 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 there's, there's nothing that you can implement that will stop somebody from issuing a lawsuit, whether it's frivolous or not, for, for one. Um, and the, 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 there's safety in numbers uh, in terms of, like I said, you get everybody in the sandbox to agree to a set of rules, and the bigger and bigger the sandbox is, the greater and greater the safety. And again, you can make the opposite argument, so okay, yeah, once we have everybody in that sandbox, then you get some patent troll that comes out of nowhere and decides to sue, try to sue everybody. But uh, obviously, there's a fair, a fairly strong, you know, nucleus then to be able to mount a defense in that case. Mm -hmm. um, hi, Rick. Um, you seem to have a pretty good portfolio of CPU cores, but do you have um, anything around peripherals that you're doing, especially, you know, the boring peripherals that you kind of just need, like SPI and I squared C and other things like that? Yes. So are they open? Yes. Okay. That's, that's what's in the Core 5 MCU. Tim, is that you underneath there? Okay. <laughs> Um, and these have been taped out countless times. Hi, Rick. I was wondering if you, if you could tell us what's your, uh, what is the plan your vision going forward with academic institutions? Because I feel like for a lot of time, the the existing IP in the ecosystem is developed either at ETH or. Um, or Princeton, and the verification, uh, work, uh, the verification work is more like, here we have finished everything. We have finished putting Linux. You can verify this RTL, but they give you some amount of confidence. But, uh, it that does not feel to be a very collaborative relationship. How do you feel that's going to be going forward? Yeah. So, um, a couple of comments there. Um, so we have money to spend. Um, and I really want to spend it. So, you know, uh, Canadian taxpayers are, are, uh, are very generous and I want to spend their money. Um, and we can spend it internationally, not just in Canada. So this is, this is the fun part. Um, but it requires some commercial sponsor to go with it, right? So they're, they're 50 cent dollars, if you will, right? The federal government gives me 50 cents. I need to match that with a, a commercial contributor and that's where you get the dollar that goes into the, the institution. Um, and so this is the first project that we did that with, and it in, engaged uh, Polytechnique Montréal, uh, an engineering school in, in Montreal, Quebec, uh, with ETH, uh, to add the vector accelerator to the CBA6, uh, to Ariane. Um, and the other fun part about you know, embracing the academic community, and I'll, I'll just go up to the slide with all the academic logos, is you know, that, that's a part of the industry, if you will, that's focused on, uh, on publishing papers, right? So there's, that's how you keep score. Um, so th there's, there's a, a, a huge, uh, you know, uh, blocker, if you will, of, no, I can't put this stuff out there right now until I get my paper published. Um, so it changes the dynamic in terms of how you do collaborative engineering in the public domain if this has got to be kept, if you will, sort of behind uh, the, f the four walls of the university before the publication happens. Uh, despite that, we have a pretty healthy engagement with research organizations. Um, and uh, we, we try to make it as easy as possible 
Uh, one of the projects that we're really pretty happy about um, uh, is uh, with uh, Oklahoma State University and Harvey Mudd College on uh, a core called WALL-E. Uh, so it's Core 5 WALL-E is going to be at the heart of the new Harris and Harris textbook uh, that's being worked on right now. And all the labs will be based on an open source core that's maintained by this community. Uh, so there's, there's lots of cool things happening. If you've got stuff that you want to work on from your institution, come talk to me. Happy to talk to you about it. Sorry, I, I guess I'm more curious about the fact that um, ARA did not go on the new tape out, but instead the CV VEC went on. I'm just kind of curious what's, because you have, it's like very so It's the same thing. So Sorry? CV VEC and ARA, yeah. that's the same project. They're the same project? Yeah, so Ariane is CVA6. And the reason that we are not using the university names is to avoid that I'd walk into my boss's office, bet my badge on the core that came from a university repo, um, and have a structure. Um, anyway, we can talk about naming. <laughs> but CVVEC is the core five name for ERA. OK. And well, that project with ETH and Poly Montreal is, is um, implementing ERA into the CVA6. I'm I'm kind of curious. Was um, was the verification of like did Open Hardware Group involve in the verification of ERA? So this is another example of uh, uh, stuff being released after publication and so on. So there was t a tightly developed uh, between Poly Montreal and ETH. Uh, the repo is being stood up now with that code, and. Uh, running Linux or running any kind of software program is not verification, right? It, it just means you might be able to run that particular application. So for RISCI, the RISCI core, the, 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 the small four-stage core, just talking about verification for a second, that had seen silicon from uh, ETH's experiments and, and different experiments before the Open Harbor Group got it, uh, I think 43 times in different geometries and implemented in a bunch of different things. Really solid, good core. When we did the verification work, we found 52 bugs uh, in, the, in the core. And it's not because they did anything wrong, right? Not at all. Uh, the verification work that gets done has no, it's, it's true verification work that's coverage driven that has no idea what application is going to be run. Just because you can stand your application up and it doesn't fall over, that doesn't mean that the core does everything that it's supposed to do and doesn't do anything that it's not supposed to do. But you know, a, a true verification plan, a true DV plan, will exercise the core on all of those extremes. Sorry if I'm being if, um, a little too. Uh, oh, sorry. I get, I get, I get <coughs> like, sorry. I, I, I guess. Sorry. Uh, sorry for the um, amount of questions I'm bringing. I'll stay here all night. So. Um, but, yeah. I, I guess my question is like, did Open Hardware Group participate in the verification of like error from like day one? Like, because you have a lot of verification, academic need verification for development. Was verification like from day one as part of your collaborative relationship or was it just like an afterthought after they have released the core? So there has been no verification in the Open Hardware uh, group ecosystem on ERA yet. In terms of inside Core 5 Verif, turn on a vector accelerator based you know, uh, verification effort. We, we use, like I said earlier, the technology readiness level scale to talk about where projects are as they migrate, if you will, through the development flow in the open hardware ecosystem. ERA will come in as TRL3, right? Basically research-based IP that has not seen, don't get me wrong, it runs all kinds of programs, does it really, really well. You know, the, the researchers are thrilled, and as far as they're concerned, they're done, right? Just like the, the, the risky core was uh, earlier. So that part of and, and some of these tape outs, I, there was another project that we'll use ERA uh, that I didn't put up here that we'll use a CV, CVVEC uh, and be taped out later this year that will start the verification journey for, and, and by the way, verifying a vector accelerator is no small feat. It's a lot of, lot of effort, a lot of work.
Cool. Well, Rick, this is fantastic to see. If I, if I may share a comment on licensing, I think I completely agree with you. For all the efforts that have gone into some sort of uh, reciprocity uh, in licensing, I think the reality is that permissive is, is the only thing that's going to fly. And um, yeah, it's incredible to see the number of people you've pulled together to work on all of this IP. Um, if, if I may comment briefly on the verification thing, um, I work at a company that tapes out these cores and puts them in their chips, and we don't use these I, this IP that has been you know thoroughly verified by UVM and whatnot. But the standard is very very high these days. I think um, and, and any core that's in any major open source project these days is pretty well um, beaten and and verified, and it's come a long way since we started you know in in. Working at open cores and um, mm. and yeah, it's 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 really impressive to see. So and you, you guys appear to be taking it to another level to uh, try and you know really get it into the commercials. So well done oh, and thank uh, thanks sure a lot for coming along and speaking to us today. There's a lot more room in the sandbox if anybody wants to jump in. So. Absolutely. <laughs> Cheers. Thanks, Rick. Thank you.